microphone. Can you hear me? Okay, great. So um, tonight uh, we're going to read uh, one 10 minute play. We're going to start with a 10 minute play, and I'm going to tell you about that in a minute. And then we're going to read the first act of a triptych that I wrote, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that when, 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 I, when we finish this. Um, first, let me introduce these wonderful actors. This is Emily Shane, and this is Mike Doyle. <laughs> They're great, so if you ever need actors, they're, <laughs> they're, pretty, they're, they're great. Um, the, the first piece, it's, it's very strange. It's, it's a 10 minute play and I, I, well it is actually somewhat strange, but, but that's actually not what I meant was strange. What, what's strange is that I had completely forgotten that there's a connection with Dan O'Brien. This play is called Journey and it's a 10 minute play and it was commissioned by um, a, a, an initiative called Book Wings, which is out of University of Iowa. And what that is, is it's a translation project. And so what, what Dan and I and uh, another playwright named Che Yu did is we were commissioned to write a play about being in transit. And there were two Chinese, or rather three Chinese writers, playwrights, who were commissioned with the same theme. And then they translated our plays. So Dan and Che and my play, the, the American plays, were translated into Chinese and performed uh, at the uh, Dramatic Arts Center in Shanghai. And then the Chinese playwrights were performed here in the States. And they've done this before, I, I think with poets, and, and uh, I think the poets were at, uh, at the, um, in Moscow, and then, and then also prose writing. So I, 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 don't, I don't know more about the initiative, but I know that in our year it was, uh, we were in Shanghai. I mean, we didn't physically go to Shanghai, but they live streamed. And, um, and so I have not heard this play in English, which is <laughs> sort of odd. Um, so this will, be, this will be a premiere of sorts. Um, it's called Journey, and uh, there are two characters, and I'll read the stage directions of the location. Um, Emily is playing a character named Grace, and Mike is playing a character named Isaac. And are you guys ready? In the darkness, a disembodied voice announces flights leaving and arriving in various foreign languages. The foreign languages are at first, I should back up for a second because it doesn't say this, it says it on the title page. This takes place in an airport terminal in a sort of an, in a, in a, in an undisclosed location. Um, well, I'll tell you a little bit more. So I'll start again, rewind. In the darkness, a disembodied voice announces flights leaving and arriving in various foreign languages. The foreign languages are at first familiar and then gradually transform into languages that are less familiar, perhaps languages we've never heard before. The announcements fade, grow distant, and fade away as the lights come up on a tiny airport terminal in a remote, icy, wintry land. A giant window looks out onto a night sky. Stars twinkle. A snowflake or two falls. Grace is the only person in the terminal. She wears a coat. She is knitting. Her ethnicity and nationality are hard to decipher. Whatever she is knitting is secreted inside a large bag at her feet. Isaac, a young American in his 20s, enters wearing a hoodie and a large backpack. He sits down. He glances over at Grace. She continues to knit. Isaac checks his iPhone. It's dead. He checks his watch. It's stopped. Isaac gets up, looks around. Nobody's around except for Grace. Excuse me, do you, have you by any chance seen anyone who works here? Or, or maybe they're on their way, maybe there's somebody on their way? Because I missed my flight and I'm not really sure when the next flight's going to be. And I know that I already missed my connection, there's no way that I'm gonna make that, I know that, but I was hoping to get out tonight because I would really like to know that I'm not going to be stuck here forever because sometimes I feel like I'm going to be stuck here forever and I'm <laughs> done, you know? I mean, I'm done with this place. What I thought was going to be what? She said it was going to be the journey. That's what she called it. She kept calling it the journey, the journey. And finally I said, Journey is a crappy band from the 80s and I am over <laughs> it. I am so over it. I am done. Are you, do, do you, do you speak English? You don't speak English. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm such an idiot. I, I should just shut up. I'm just going to shut up now. That's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to shut up. Don't stop believing. <laughs> what? Don't stop believing. It's Journey's greatest hit ever. You speak English? I do. You know Journey? A bit. 
How do you know Journey? They are known the world over. Everybody knows Journey. The most <laughs> humble shepherd on the most remote mountaintop knows Journey. The smallest child in the most distant land, village, he knows Journey. Everybody knows the band that is Journey. <laughs> How did that happen? Nobody, nobody should know the band that is Journey. <laughs> The band that is Journey should be consigned to the dustbin of history. There should be, they should be hurled into a black hole of oblivion where their music will be forever erased from the consciousness of mankind and never heard of them again. What is it with this place? Jesus, it's like the land that time forgot. Where is everybody? Have you seen anyone? You? I don't count. Of course you do. You think you don't count? You count. That's not what I mean. That's not what I'm trying to... Oh... Oh, I get it. You're one of them. Uh, what am I? You know. I'm afraid I don't. You know, a friend to Jesus. I like Jesus. Oh, I bet you do. I'm not sure I would call him my friend. That seems rather intimate. <laughs> okay, look, I respect where you're coming from, but I'm not interested. Not interested in what? I don't want to be converted. I don't want to be preached to. I don't want to think about salvation or judgment day or the rapture. I just want to do my own thing. Okay. Great, good. I'm glad that we understand each other. You mistake me, I think, for something I am not. Or you mistake me for somebody else. Isaac experiences a flicker of recognition, a sense of deja vu. Has he seen Grace before? Does she remind him of someone else, something else? He has a thought, but then it slips away. You're not some kind of missionary. No. I just thought, I, I don't know what I thought. There was this Mormon guy I met in Siberia. He kept trying to convert me. 18 hours on a train listening to this guy. He just would not stop. And that smile, that earnest smile, <laughs> all that certitude, that serenity, I just about wanted to kill him. I'm sorry, I, I've been traveling nonstop. I'm a little fried, forgive me. You thought I was Mormon? I don't know, I don't know what I thought. I am not Mormon. Okay. Look, I do not belong to any organized religion. Okay. I, I worship the sky and the clouds. I worship the feel of the sunlight. I worship all the colors of the setting sun. I worship the first snowfall, those very first snowflakes swirling down from above. I worship the feel of the wind in the air. If I worship anything, I would say I worship those things. It's okay to worship things. I know, I, I know that. Look, it's just, I don't want to be born again. Being born again is just not for me. But you will be. All of us will be born again. It is the nature of things. The only question is as what? What are you saying? Uh, are you saying that I'm going to come back as a what? A, a wombat? A, a wildebeest? A two-toed sloth? Anything is possible. You could come back as a dung beetle. You could come back as a skink. I don't even know what that is. It's a uh, rather common sort of reptile found the world over. Sometimes people confuse it with a snake because its legs are rather stubby, and some skinks, in fact, have no legs. It's, it's true, but a skink is not a snake. And though I can understand why someone might make that mistake, it's a very natural mistake to make. I don't care about skinks. I don't care, and I don't believe in reincarnation. They exist. They exist, whether you believe in them or not. We are quite small, you see, and our beliefs are even smaller. Something in what Grace says hits Isaac hard. He turns his attention back to his iPhone. It still doesn't work. He checks his watch. It's still not working too. Why isn't this working? It's like the Bermuda Triangle here. Something is blocking the signal. It just gets searching, searching. It's gotta be the mountains. That's in the storm. What storm? The first storm of winter. It's going to be a big one. I can feel it. There's no storm. That's not in the forecast. Something in the air shifts, the faintest sound like a distant melody. Listen, don't you feel it? No, no, I don't. I, I, I feel nothing, not a goddamn thing, not a goddamn thing. Isaac gives up on his iPhone. I just want to go home. I just want to go home. It feels like I've been traveling forever. It feels like I've been in these clothes forever. It feels like I haven't slept in forever, really slept, like in a bed, in, like in a real bed, my own bed. I miss my own bed. <coughs> it just feels like I'm never gonna get home. Something will happen eventually. A plane will land, a pilot will appear, an airline representative will turn the computers on and issue a you a boarding pass. Yeah, but when? Why am I even asking you? You don't know. How would you know? You're in the same boat I am. 
It's useless. It's no use. Isaac is bereft. Grace stops knitting. It could be worse, you know. Oh, yeah? How so? You could come back as a single-celled organism. <laughs> or a sea sponge sucking water at the bottom of the sea. Enough. God, you're just like... Who? Nobody. It's a strange place to travel to. So remote, so off the beaten path. It's not a place you just happen to end up. I mean, if you're from here, like me, well, I mean, that's one thing. But if you're a visitor, a tourist, that's another story. You would have to really plan to get here. You would have to go out of your way to end up here. You would have to have a reason. You know, you talk a lot. No <laughs> offense, but yeah, you talk a lot. And sometimes people, sometimes they don't feel like talking. Sometimes they just want to sit in silence. They just want to rest their mouths, just look out into the night sky, look out into the stars in silence. Isaac looks out the window in silence. More snowflakes. I think you're right about the storm. <laughs> fuck. Oh, fuck. I'm never getting out of this place. I'm stuck. Isaac glances back at Grace. She continues to knit. Did you say you're from here? I did. Are you in a loot? In a loot. An illusion. I think the term is a loot. And no, no, I'm not. But you said you were from here. I did. Well, that doesn't make sense. The only people that are from here are a loot. That is true. The only people from here are a loot. But you just said, you know what? Never mind. Forget <laughs> it. I said anything. Just forget it. Who is she? The she who said there was going to be a journey. That she. Just a friend. Like Jesus is a friend? Not like <laughs> Jesus is a friend, no. Where is she now? I don't know. Drinking bourbon with some Norwegian biologist in some Arctic <laughs> substation somewhere. Some guy named Olaf or Sven. Some stoic, carefree, emotionally mature genius who excels in some Olympic sport in his spare time. <laughs> Speed skating. The snow begins to fall more heavily. What does she do, your friend? You ever hear about the Arctic tern? It's a bird. It's a kind of bird. Not a very big bird, but about four ounces, gray and white, the color of old snow. Seemingly unremarkable in every way, except for one thing. This bird, this small bird, flies about 22,000 miles every year, roughly the circumference of the Earth. Every year, it does this. It starts in the Arctic, then flies down to the Antarctic. It spends pretty much most of its life flying through the air, through ice storms and freezing rain, through fields of lightning and frigid temperatures. This is what it does. And what she does... Your friend. My friend. What she does is try to figure out how this bird, this little stupid bird, how it flies these enormous distances year in and year out, how it knows how to do this and how it survives, because it shouldn't. By all logic, this little bird should not be able to travel these distances and live to tell the tale, but it does. Against all odds, it does. Maybe it's just trying to get home. It's an awful long way to get home. So you followed your friend to the Arctic to look at the bird. Many birds, flocks and flocks of these birds carpeting the tundra. As far as the eye can see, birds, whole a whole world of birds squawking and chirping and crapping and mating and laying their eggs. Six months of this. I thought I was going to lose my mind. Birds, birds everywhere, birds. For her, it was the journey of a lifetime. For me, it was like, when is this going to end? I told her that was it. I told her if she wanted to be with me, she needed to come home with me now. I was done. I was over it. If I didn't see another one of those goddamn birds again... I really messed up. She was the one. You see all these movies and you hear all these stupid love songs and they talk about love and you think you know what that is. And then you meet someone and it just clicks. You get it. All of a sudden, you know, you just get it. She was the one. She was the one and I blew it. And now I can't stop thinking about her. I think about her, and I think of home. home. I want to go home. I want to go home, but it feels so far away. Isaac closes his eyes. Do you know what happens right before the birds take off? It happens right when the first snow begins to fall. Do you know what happens? 
the birds get very quiet. It's been so noisy for so long, and suddenly, silence. And all you can hear is the wind and the sound of the waves, but the birds, the birds become silent. It's as if they're listening, breathing in the stillness, taking it all in, remembering everything, because they may not make it back. And even if they do, it won't be the same. Grace listens. She hears the snowfall. She hears the sound of birds in the distance, the sounds of the ocean, the sound of glaciers cracking and crashing together. She listens to the sound of Isaac breathing. Then Grace transforms into a bird and flies away. End of play. Thank, thank you. That was that was the first time it's been heard in English. So that's great. Um, uh, so that's a ten minute play. And for those of you not in the theater, ten minute plays are in a way the sort of the short stories, I guess, of, of theater. And, and and it's quite a popular form. Um, this next excerpt that um, that that we'll be reading is is uh, is from a play that is actually full length play, and it's a full length play that's a triptych or a three act structure. And uh, it's called Concerning Strange Devices from the Distant West, which is a, is a very unwieldy title that um, the director who directed the premiere of that play teased me about. He's actually in the audience, and he teased me about it all the time. Um, but but that, that is the play. And it's actually, um, I should give you some background. So the play n takes place in three parts that are in three different um, historical moments. So the first act, which we'll be reading, takes place in Yokohama the city of Yokohama in Japan uh, in 1884, which is, uh, in Japan, was, was the, called the Meiji era, uh, Meiji period, and, and in the United States, that corresponds to the, sort of the Gilded Age. And it's, it's, a, it's a really fascinating time in, in Japanese history because, you know, Japan for centuries had been closed off from the rest of the world, and really the only uh, point of entry was an island called Deshima, which is near actually Nagasaki, and that's where um, Jesuit priests were there and some uh, Dutch traders, but everything was pretty much, if you were a foreigner, you had to stay in this confined space. But then in the Meiji period, it, it just, it, they opened the doors, and for the Japanese, it, it was a very, it was a time of tremendous change. And so you'll see uh, their prints and photographs from that period. You see Japanese women in these sort of hoop skirts and, and you see Japanese men, the emperor and emperor, the emperor wearing, you know, a kind of a bowler hat and <coughs> tails. And it's, it, it's so, I mean, just the way they dressed uh, and, and then all the inventions. And, and one of the inventions was the camera. The camera first came to Japan in, I believe, the early 1840s, but n it was a daguerreotype, you know, like the, the sort of, a, like sort of the Matthew Brady Civil War type camera, but nobody knew how to use it. And so um, about 10 years later, a manuscript came to Japan, and the manuscript was titled Concerning Strange Devices from the Distant West. And it had, it had sort of schematics, and, it ha and so after that point, um, the camera became very popular. And um, so this first part uh, I I of the play is in 1884, as I said, in Yokohama, which was where a lot of foreigners came, more so than Tokyo. And uh, the, m the character that Mike is reading is, a, is, a, is based on an actual person named Farsari. And Farsari was um, uh, actually an Italian photographer. Don't do an accent, no, no less than we did. <laughs> but he, he, um, he, he uh, became an expatriate. And like Lafcadio Hearn, there were a number of them, these Europeans who decided to make a home for themselves in Japan. And uh, he became very prosperous. And the way that he became very prosperous is he took these staged photographs of Japanese um, men and women. Uh, it, and he would stage, so he would have rickshaw drivers in his studio, and, and he would have uh, geisha, or women who were actually sort of tea hostesses, but they were sort of dressed in geisha kind of uh, costumes and then he would sell them to very curious Western audience. It was very popular. But the other thing that was very popular is Western tourists would come and the women would want to dress up like Japanese women. So that figures, you'll hear, you'll, that's part of what happens. Um, so Mike is reading the photographer, Farsari. 
Uh, and Emily is reading uh, a, a, a traveler from the United States named Isabel Hewitt, a kind of a wealthy woman. And my colleague and very good sport, <laughs> Ken Weitzman, is reading uh, um, uh, Edmund Hewitt, who's Isabel's husband. And uh, the, 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 this first part takes place in two locations. Um, the first location, well, it, actually, the very first scene is sort of uh, in a, out of time. But then the second scene, th th it's his studio. It's Farsari's photography studio. Um, and what you need to remember is that that second scene, there is, and I will read it in the stage directions, but you just have to kind of envision it. There is a semi-naked man, a rickshaw driver, whose body is covered in tattoos. And so he's kind of the elephant in the room in that second scene. And I think that's all you need to know, I think. Um, all right. Concerning strange devices from the distant west. Uh, I'll read you the quote. The quote is from Oscar Wilde. The whole of Japan is pure invention. There is no such country. There are no such people. Uh, Isabel Hewlett, a 19th century American tourist. Farsari, a 19th century photographer living in Japan. And Edmund Hewlett, an American businessman visiting Japan. Scene one. In the darkness, the sound of the flute. Light on Isabel Hewlett, a woman in Victorian dress. I came to Japan because of a photograph I saw once upon a time, a long time ago. I was a very little girl. I had crept into my father's study and gone to his desk and opened a drawer, and in that drawer I came upon a box. And in that box was a photograph, a picture of a man. Light on a tattooed man. He is a beautiful young Japanese man. He is almost naked. His body is covered in tattoos. He was like nothing I had ever seen before. He had tattoos over most of his body, all over his chest and his back, all up and down his arms and on the upper part of his leg, his thighs. He was practically naked. I'd never seen a naked man before. I couldn't take my eyes off of him, and I remember, I remember feeling a kind of heat rising under my skin and the strangest sensation in my belly as if I had been suddenly dropped from a great height and was falling. The sound of the flute fades away. Light shift, scene two. A photographic studio in Yokohama, 1884. Farsari, the photographer, is setting up his camera. The tattooed man sits for a photograph. Isabel stands in the doorway. Forgive me, I don't know what possessed me to confess such a thing or to come here today. I was lost, you see, and I saw your sign and I thought, I thought, I don't know what I thought. I really ought to go. Where did he get it? Excuse me? Your father, where did he get the picture? Oh, I, I don't know. It was before I was born. He was a very peculiar man. He traveled a great deal. And you find that peculiar? No, of course not. I, I didn't mean to say that. I myself am traveling now. And you are not peculiar in the least. No, no, I'm not. I, I'm very ordinary. I'm the most ordinary woman you will ever meet. It's just that my father, he was simply, well, he had a taste for curiosities. Photographs of naked men. Among other things, he collected odd little souvenirs. They were all over our house where I grew up. Spears and blowpipes and strange little idols from I'm not sure where. Some godless heathen land, no doubt, where heathens engage in all sorts of godless heathen rituals, as heathens are wont to do. Did he have a shrunken head by chance? He did, in fact. I thought he might. Alas, I cannot offer you shrunken heads, only naked men. Excuse me? Or I should say, more precisely, one semi-naked man. Oh, I, no, no, I hadn't intended to make a purchase. <laughs> and certainly not one of, well? A semi-naked man? Yes. Perhaps you'd prefer a photograph of a temple or a shrine, some serene landscape, Mount Fuji at daybreak, tiny peasants toiling in a distant field? No, no thank you. You don't care for landscapes? No, I do. Perhaps you're looking for a photograph of native types, stable boys or street peddlers, or perhaps you'd prefer a lady. Ladies are very popular, ladies with fans, ladies sipping tea, ladies plucking oysters from the briny deep. So many ladies engaged in all manners of activity. I really, I should go. <laughs> Forgive me for interrupting you. Thank you for your time. Isabel begins to leave. My shop is rather hard to find, Miss, Mrs. Hewlett. I can't imagine you simply stumbled here upon it by chance. This part of Yokohama, well, it's not the part of the city that ladies like yourself frequent. And what kind of lady do you take me to be? 
A rich American lady, a well-intentioned do-gooder. I am neither well-intentioned, nor do I think I do much good. Oh, I doubt that. I've seen your type before. You come to Yokohama to teach the natives English, to spread the word of the Lord. People are not always what they seem, Mr. Farsari. I'm not sure I agree with you, madam. In my experience, people are often exactly what they seem. It's uh, very disappointing. <laughs> you take a lot of pictures of locals, do you? That is all my clients seem to want these days. Rickshaw drivers and geisha girls. No need to avert your gaze. Go ahead and stare all you want. He doesn't mind. Where did you find him? In front of the Grand Hotel. Just milling about in a state of undress? He's a rickshaw driver, madam. He has little need for a top coat or trousers. Has he always been a rickshaw driver, do you suppose? I would imagine so. What a hard life. I doubt he thinks so. Then again, I have no idea what he thinks, really. Did he grow up here in Yokohama? That I cannot say. Perhaps he came from the countryside. Perhaps his family were farmers, rice farmers, or perhaps his father was a noble samurai who fell out of favor with his lord and was forced to take his own life in order to preserve, preserve his honor. You have, a, <laughs> you have a very vivid imagination, madam. What's his name? How would I know? How can you not know his name? His name and life story are of no import to me. All I ask is that he go where I tell him to go and do as I ask him to do. He sits so still. He best sits still. If he moves, the whole thing is shot to hell. All you'll see is a blur of light, flesh and light. You won't even know what you're looking at. Does he understand any English? Enough to tell you the price you'll pay for his services. As you would tell me, no doubt, what I will pay for yours. I thought Madam had no interest in purchasing a, purchasing a photograph. I suppose it will depend on the photograph. And what might you be looking for? I'll know it when I see it. When I see it, I'll know. Isabel stares at the tattooed man. My god, look at all those tattoos. It's just extraordinary. Isabel approaches him. They call it Irizumi. It's a very ancient art form here, dating back to 1000 BC. The ink they use, they, called it, they call it Nara ink. It turns a kind of blue-green under the skin. The artists use it to trace the form, and then they fill the image with different shades, crimson, vermilion, cerulean, lapis, aubergine. They say the first Japanese to tattoo themselves were fishermen. They tattoo themselves from head to toe with demons and fierce monsters. In the event their ships capsized, they believe these creatures etched into their skin might scare away the monsters of the deep. To become a more frightening monster than the monsters who await you? So the reasoning goes. Do you think it worked? We'll never know. The sailors in question are debating the matter somewhere at the bottom of the sea. I was told it was the fashion in Japan for young women to get tattooed. Not these days. A proper lady wouldn't dream of it. In the Edo period, things were a bit different. A young woman and her lover would get secret tattoos that fit together like puzzle pieces. When their bodies entwined in the act of making love, the pieces would conjoin to form a complete image. What sort of image? One can only imagine. What if their love affair ended? What if the other person disappointed them? What if they broke their heart? What then? They'd have a rather awkward souvenir. <coughs> it's an amazing thing, isn't it? To capture his likeness, it's like a memory you can hold in your hands. It's like a kind of magic. There's no magic, really. It's more a kind of science. There is a lens, there is a mirror, there are chemicals mixed in just the right proportions, Silver nitrate, alcohol, nitric acid, ether. And then there are the most essential elements of all, time and light. The explosion of a camera flash. Isabel Farsari and the tattooed man vanish. Darkness. Scene three. A thousand cicadas hidden in the darkness. The sound their wings make. Light up on a Japanese woman in a kimono looking in the mirror. She pulls the combs from her hair. Long black hair comes tumbling down. Flash, light up on a little girl running. Flash, light up on a blind monk playing flute. Flash, the flute transforms into the sound of an orchestra. Scene four, the faint sound of an orchestra, distant voices and laughter. The Grand Hotel in Yokohama, the evening of the same day. Light on Farsari and Edmund Hewlett, a man in Victorian dress. He wears a top hat and top coat. If you must know, I find Japan a dreadful place. The food is atrocious, the fleas are legion, and everyone where, where one goes is greeted by the scent of raw sewage and never-ending din of scabrous street vendors peddling their awful little knickknacks, 
Samurai swords, bronze, Buddhas, they swear to you are the rarest of treasures, pilfered from some ancient temple somewhere. Don't believe a word they say. <laughs> These people are inveterate liars. Light on Farsari, he lights a cigar. They smile and lie without a second thought. They have no scruples, none at all. How is it that this charmless little country, a spray of islands on the other side of the world, has captured the imaginations of so many? Some people find Japan magical. Some people are fools. And yet you are here. That I am, much to my chagrin. Edmund extends his hand. Edmund Hewlett. Hewlett, you say? Yes, that's right. And you are? Farsari. The photographer. I've heard of you. They say you're a genius, a true artist. Go to Farsari if you want a taste of the real Japan. That's what they tell me. And so you live here in Yokohama, do you? You actually live here? I do. How very novel. <laughs> do you live in a little thatched hut? Do you sleep on the floor on a little straw mat? Do you eat fish and noodles for supper? I live in a brick house. I sleep in a four-poster bed, and my cook makes steak and eggs for me every morning. Does she? <laughs> Well, perhaps you'll be good enough to have me over. I've had a devil of a time getting a decent meal here. Everywhere I go, it's raw fish and pickles, rice gruel and fermented beans. The indigenous food is an acquired taste. One I assure you I will never acquire. This is your first time in Japan? No. Actually, no. I've been once before. A second trip to a country you despise? My business brings me here. I see. And what line of business are you in? Oh, it's not half as interesting as what you do. <laughs> what I do is not in the least bit interesting. Come now. You're an artist. You make art. I sell pretty pictures to tourists. People like me. People who prefer pretty pictures to the reality. Or people too foolish to know the difference. Nobody wants an ugly picture, for sorry. There's enough ugliness in the world as it is. You can't blame a man for seeking out a little beauty, can you? So what exactly is it you sell, Mr. Hewlett? Me? Guns. I sell guns. The best that money can buy, in fact. Fully automatic, capable of firing over 600 rounds per minute. One gunner can take out a whole battalion of men. Makes everything that came before obsolete. The Japs are quite keen on them, as it turns out. Some days I think they want to take over the world. Funny little monkeys, aren't they? The men, well, the men are just ridiculous barking out orders, striding around, terrible table manners. Have you eaten with a Jap lately? Good God, it's just awful, slurping their soup, picking their teeth. Now the women, the women, well, they're a different story. Lovely creatures, quite beguiling, like tiny little dolls, so childlike, so innocent, and yet there's something just underneath, something I can't quite fathom. Tell me. Are you married, Fasari? No, no, I'm not. My wife is here with me now. I brought her to Japan with me. It was a mistake. The woman is driving me insane. <laughs> Night and day, I'm subject to her incessant questions about the people and the place, what I think, what I see, where I go, what I do, the company I keep, her constant chatter and throbbing need, her infernal quest to know everything there is to know about everything I tell you. If she was devoted, a fraction of her energy to pleasing me instead of lying in her bed like a disinterred corpse. Mr. Hewlett, I have no interest in hearing the intimate details of your private life, if you don't mind. <coughs> Forgive me. I just... Forgive me. Looks like you've done well enough here. Made a life for yourself. I have no complaints. A man with no complaints. That's a rare thing. Perhaps my expectations are more modest than some. Listen, I'll tell you what. How about I send my wife around to your shop tomorrow? She could sit for a portrait. She could wear one of those kimonos. Stick a few sprigs of cherry blossoms in her hair. Take a picture. It's all the rage back in the States, you know, to dress up like a geisha girl and have your picture taken. She'd like that. Oh, I don't know. I insist. Light on Isabel in a partial state of undress. Edmund looks at her. It'll give her a little diversion. Something to do with herself. At the very least, she'll have a pretty picture to take home with her. A souvenir. Flash. Edmund exits. Farsari remains. Scene five. Light shift. Farsari studio the next day. Isabel stands with her arms extended. A servant girl is dressing her in a kimono. Good God, it's worse than a corset. My ribs are cracking, I can't breathe. And now you're supposed to say you look radiant. 
You look ravishing. You look radiant. You look ravishing. <laughs> You're a poor liar, Mr. Farsari. I look like a whale encased in silk. The servant girl laughs. You understand? You speak English, don't you? She speaks English. The servant girl doesn't answer. She continues to stra straighten Isabel's kimono. Do you live near here? The servant girl doesn't answer. She's having trouble with the fabric. It won't fold over as it should. What is your name? Who taught you English? Do you understand? Do you understand me? Mohi Achi A.E.K. The servant girl exits quickly. Well, that was rather rude. You have no idea what I said. It was your tone I was remarking on. And what was my tone? <coughs> Angry, brusque, not at all kind. That's simply the nature of the language. This is not Italy or France, madam. Japanese is not the language of poets. The language of rice merchants. Uh, who is she? Why are you so curious about the natives? First you want to know the rickshaw driver's name, now you inquire after my servant girl's language skills. And so she works for you, does she? Yes, she works for me. In what capacity? She dresses up inquisitive American women in pretty silk kimonos so they can have a souvenir of themselves to put up in their parlor back home. Look, Aunt Ida, it's me. I'm wearing a kimono. And that's all she does, is it? Dress up your clients in these infernal tubes of silk? She has been known to wash a teacup. Sometimes I send her to the market to haggle with the fishmonger. She drives a very hard bargain. What exactly are you getting at? I wonder if you perhaps have an arrangement with what her. What sort of arrangement? I think you know what I'm getting at. I have at. no idea what you're getting some at. Some informal arrangement, some kind of understanding, some kind of mutual understanding. Are you always this obtuse, madam? Do you have sexual intercourse with her? I beg your pardon. Are you heard me. Is fornication part and parcel of her daily household duties? To pleasure you in ways no proper woman would? Madam, I assure you, I have no arrangement with that girl, informal or otherwise. If you must know, my tastes run more towards those of my own sex. Not that what I do in my own bedroom is any concern of yours. A word of advice, if I may. In the future, you might consider keeping your own counsel on matters of which you know nothing about. Forgive me. Please. I misspoke. You did a good deal more than misspeak. I'm sorry. I don't know what's come over me. This place, this place, it makes me not myself. Everything feels upside down and turned around. Madam, please, can you please just be silent? Can you manage that, please? The gall, the unmitigated gall. People like you. Excuse me? You and your husband My both. husband. You drive me mad. I beg your pardon. You make all these assumptions, cheap, tawdry assumptions, rooted in the most ignorant and provincial worldview about men and women, about anyone who might possibly be in the least bit different Sir, than you. Sir, you have no right. I have every right. You come to Japan and you think you can stride around the country as if it were a shop of curiosities, where everything and every one were laid out to satisfy your every whim and desire. The myopia. The smug and insufferable sense of entitlement is more than I can stomach. Now kindly stand still and cease talking so I may take your goddamn picture. Isabel tries to stand still. A moment passes and then another. I have no Aunt Ida. I was speaking metaphorically. And this was not my idea, it was my husband's idea. Madam, please, do you want me to take your picture or not? No, I do not. You speak to me in the most atrocious way. You have no right to speak to me in this way. And this dress is an abomination. I cannot stand still one moment longer in this wretched dress. Isabel tries to unwrap the obi. What foolishness! I can't believe I went along with this ill-fated venture. I should have known better. This knot, I can't undo this knot. Isabel tears the kimono by accident. Damn it. Here, just let me. Farsari helps Isabel undo the knot. Why didn't you tell him we had met? I had a sense you might not want your husband to know you were trolling around the red light district of Yokohama in search of God knows what. I thought I was doing you a favor. I don't need for you to do me any favors. You need not worry about me. He thought you were very odd, you know. He couldn't understand how a civilized person would choose to live in a place like this. Your husband and I have very different views on what it means to be civilized, I assure Am you. Am I meant to defend him? Because I won't. You may do as you choose. It is of no consequence to me. I am nothing like my husband. No? No. In fact, I am nothing like him at all. This was a mistake. I'm sorry to have taken up any more of your time. Isabel begins looking for her dress. Where is your servant girl? Is she here? She took away my dress. Where is she? I need my dress. May I have my dress, please? Thunder. Isabel becomes more frantic looking for her dress. Farsari finally retrieves Isabel's dress and gives it to her. She is very upset. 
Why did you come here, Mrs. Hewlett? I don't, I don't know. I don't believe you. Believe what you wish. Was it not the frisson you felt upon seeing a semi-naked man when you were just a little girl? Or perhaps you're just one of those lady travelers, one of those intrepid matrons enamored of all things exotic, the titillating, the strange. How is it you think so poorly of me? Am I so pathetic in your eyes, so ridiculous and beneath contempt? A fool, is that how I seem to you? A complete and utter fool? Is that what you see when you look at me, is it? Well, you would not be alone. Madam. No, please don't, don't say another word. Thunder. You ought not listen to me, you know. I'm a terrible man, bilious and intel intemperate, disliked by most who meet me. Why do you think I live on the other side of the world, far from everyone I've ever known? I'm sorry, I truly am. You didn't stumble upon my shop by chance, did you? No. Why did you seek me out? It's not you I was seeking out. You're not the one I was looking for. It's just, have you ever seen something and you can't make sense of it? As if you're in a dream and you recognize bits and pieces, things you know, a person you know, but you can't make out the whole. Something doesn't fit and you can't, you can't make it fit. It's like a puzzle and every time you try to put it together, it's as if the mind rebels. It's as if your mind can't translate what your eyes are seeing. It's as if you can't bear to see what it is you're seeing. You can't bear it. Forgive me. No, I think I'm beginning to understand. Thunder and then the sound of rain. When I first came to this place, I met a young man. Light on a young man with a box, a beautiful young Japanese man. He was a beautiful young man. Just a boy, really, a beautiful, beautiful boy. I was walking in a part of the city I did not know, and I saw him. I remember he was standing in a doorway, and he beckoned to me, and I went to him. And as I got closer, I saw that in his hands he had a box, a small lacquer box. And slowly, slowly he lifted the lid, and I heard this sound, a kind of whirring sound like the motor of an engine or the cogs of some invisible machine. And I looked inside, and inside I saw something shifting and moving, shimmering and iridescent, and I couldn't decipher what it was. I had no words for it. It was like nothing I had ever seen before. And then suddenly the thing flew out of the box and into my face, something hard and sharp, and I closed my eyes. I shut them tight, and for a moment, for a moment, I couldn't see. Sudden darkness. The darkness is complete and absolute. Scene six. A thousand cicadas invisible in the darkness, the sound their wings make, a kind of whirring, the sound of breathing, the sound of love making, fl flickers of flesh and light, indecipherable, flash, light up on a Japanese woman in a kimono looking in the mirror, her hair is long and black, it trails on the floor, she undoes her kimono, the kimono drops, white skin and black hair, flash, a little girl runs past and is gone, flash, the sound of a flute, Light up on a blind monk playing flute, flash, the sound of rain and thunder. Scene seven, light up on Farsari's studio one month later. Outside it's pouring rain. Farsari is taking a photograph of a blind monk. Edmund enters with umbrella. Jesus, it's raining cats and dogs out there. It's been raining for weeks now, weeks and weeks. When will it stop raining? I might as well be back in Boston for God's sakes. And then the goddamn rickshaw driver couldn't find his way. The monk exits. Blind, is he? Yes, Mr. Hewlett, he's blind. Strange. I had a blind masseur come work on my back the other day. Remarkable hands. He found every ache and pain, aches and pains I didn't even know I had. Is this one a masseur, too? No, Mr. Hewlett, he's not a masseur. He's a monk. A monk, you say? Yes, Mr. Hewlett, a monk. Are you in need of some spiritual sustenance? I'm sure he'd be happy to oblige. No, no, that's quite all right. Awful lot of blind people here, aren't there? <laughs> Must be something in the water, perhaps, some kind of parasite, poor hygiene in general, or perhaps some kind of mineral deficiency in their diet. These people and their damn primitive medieval, really, but I'm trying to tell them that, and you'll get your head lopped off. May I help you with something, Mr. Hewlett? I'm rather pressed for time. Yes, of course. Of course, no, I understand. I understand completely. Well, this is rather awkward. I was wondering if perhaps you've seen my wife. 
She's gone. Gone where? I don't know. I checked the manifest on the last four ships leaving Yokohama Harbor, and her name wasn't on any of them. I thought she might have stopped by your shop. I know she bought a photograph from you a few weeks back. It's of a young man. He's holding a lacquer box. Do you remember it? I guess there's some kind of insect inside the box. You can't see it, but it's in there. I understand they make a kind of uh, music with their wings. A cicada. A cicada. That's right. That's what she said. That's right. I don't know where your wife is, Mr. Hewlett. I wish I could help you, but I can't. Now, if you'll excuse me. Frisari begins to exit. Wait. Please. There's a woman, you see. Light on a Japanese woman. I met her the last time I was in Japan. She lives in a house not too far from here. I visit her on occasion. I think my wife, I think she may have followed me one evening when I went to visit her. It's funny. I felt someone watching us. Have you ever had that feeling? There was a moon that night, bright enough you could see by. I heard footsteps, and I went to the sliding door, and I saw that it was ajar, as though someone had opened it, just barely. And I went out into the street and looked to see if there was someone there. But there was no one. The sound of cicadas. You took her picture once, you know. Not my wife. Hiroko. That's her name. She posed for you. She was with some other girls from the tea house where she works. You asked her to take her hair down. The Japanese woman in kimono looks at herself in the mirror. You gave her a mirror. You told her to look at her reflection. You told her to be very still. And then you took her picture. The sound of cicadas grows. Hiroko gave it to me, the photograph. I kept it in a box with some of my other papers. That and the lease to the house where she lives. She lives there with her daughter. Our daughter. A photograph of a little girl appears, a little Amerasian girl. She looks like me. It's uncanny. I look in her face and I see myself and also, also something else. Something that is wholly other, wholly foreign. Something I will never grasp. Something that will always be just beyond my reach. The sound of cicadas grows. The sound transforms into fire. The photograph of the little girl burns away, a blinding whiteness, darkness. So uh, we're not going to read the whole, s what happens in the middle section, many things happen in the middle section, but for the purposes of, of telling you now, the Asian characters who are silent in that first section become the main characters in the second act, and it's completely flipped around, and the second act is in the uh, 20, 21st century, so it's present day Tokyo. Too complicated to tell you what happens. Um, <laughs> but the third act, um, is, is a kind of ghost act. So the third act is all uh, different historical periods in time. Everybody's kind of dead, basically, in the <laughs> third act. Um, but um, the last scene of the play, I, we're going to read to you. It's short, and, and you find out what happened to Isabel Hewlett. So you'll have to pretend that you've been in the theater for uh, another you know, 40 minutes, <laughs> and now we have the scene. And uh, this is the last scene of the play. And... Uh, Okay. All right, scene 16. The sound of flute continues. Light on the actress playing Isabel Hewlett. She's in Victorian dress. Oh, the lovemaking. It was just remarkable, really. It was positively oceanic. Wave upon wave of pure, unadulterated pleasure, currents of pleasure coursing through me in waves I could never have imagined possible. My skin still tingles at the memory of him his touch. Even now, he made me feel so alive. A rickshaw driver. Can you imagine? <laughs> he didn't speak a word of English. Didn't matter in the least. The sound of the flute continues. I outlived him by many, many years. He died of typhoid fever. I had his ashes buried in a grave beside a small country inn. He died so young. I have a photograph of him. That's all that's left. I have a photograph of her as well. Light up on a tiny figure in the distance. She becomes more clear as Isabel speaks. It's the Japanese woman in the kimono from the first section. She is looking at herself in a mirror. She pulls the combs from her hair. Long black hair comes tumbling down. Right before I left Yokohama, I went through Edmund's desk, through all his things, and I found a box. It was locked, and so I took a knife and pried it open, and inside, inside, I found a picture of a Japanese woman. 
The Japanese woman turns to look at Isabel. Your picture. And on the back, in handwriting, I didn't recognize a single word, a woman's name. Hiroko. It's a pretty name. Hiroko. What became of you, I wonder? And the little girl, your little girl, what became of her? Did she live to see the streetcars and steam engines? Did she live to hear music playing on a phonograph? The sound of a song from the beginning of the 20th century, it plays on an old-fashioned phonograph, a scratchy and ancient recording. The Japanese woman rises. As she rises, her kimono falls to the ground. Beneath her kimono, she wears contemporary clothes. As Isabel speaks, the Japanese woman puts on a coat. She puts on a pair of gloves. She picks up a blue umbrella. Did she call you long distance? Did she hear the crackle of tiny wires stretching across the miles? Did she live to see the city sparkle with neon lights? Did she live to hear the airplanes flying overhead? Did she hear the bombs falling from a bright blue sky? Did she see them before she... The Japanese woman snaps open her blue umbrella and vanishes. Flash. Phonograph music vanishes. Isabel Hewlett remains. And me, you ask. What became of me? Oh, I traveled all over Japan, and the things that I saw, magnificent things. Ancient temples and giant Buddhas, a mountain of skulls, a haunted forest, the ruins of a castle destroyed hundreds of years ago in a war no one can remember anymore. It was perched on the edge of a cliff, I remember that, and below there was a valley, emerald green rice fields as far as the eye can see, and beyond that, a river, the sound of a river rushing towards an unseen ocean, and beyond that, Mount Fuji rising out of the clouds into the light, and the light, it was so bright, a kind of brilliant, shimmering light, radiant, beautiful, so beautiful, I have no words to describe it to you. You'll see it for yourself someday. You'll see it, and you'll know. Isabel Hewlett fades away like an old photograph exposed to the light. A flash, end of play.